Welcome everybody to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatoric Seminar. Uh, we are very happy today to have uh, Apurva Khare from the Indian Institute of Science. He's going to talk about polia frequency sequences, analysis meets algebra. Apurva. Okay. So thanks again uh, for inviting me. <clears throat> very glad to be here <laughs> virtually and hopefully less virtually you know, soon enough, hopefully, let us see. So today I want to talk about uh, <clears throat> Uh, 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 yeah, uh, a nice venue, a nice meeting ground for analysis in algebra. And so it will start with maybe a little more analysis and end with a little more algebra. Let's see. So, uh, or maybe not, I don't know. So, okay, so let's see. So, uh, let me start by explaining what these things are. So, uh, a matrix, possibly rectangular, doesn't need to be square, is totally positive if all the minors are positive. So, you look at every entry, you look at every two by two minor and they need not be from consecutive rows and consecutive columns. You don't need that. And similarly, one can define totally non-negative matrices. And these kind of matrices, uh, so no, just like positive semi-definite matrices are things that show up ubiquitously in applications through covariance and correlation matrices. Uh, these kind of matrices show up all over mathematics. So here are some areas <clears throat> with maybe some kind of an artificial line drawn between analysis and algebra or something. So, you know, I'm starting sort of with the historical origins, if you will, of various people, Polya, Schoenberg, their students, Lovner and his students and so on. Carlin has worked on them. Uh, so Efron and Carlin were colleagues at Stanford Statistics, for instance, and so on. And they show up in splines, you know, more towards the applied side, Gabor analysis, and matrix theory, obviously, they are matrices. So many, many people have worked on them. Um, in the representation theory, <clears throat> a matrix, if you will, if you think about, say, a square and maybe even invertible matrix, which is totally non-negative or totally positive, then that's an example of a type A totally positive element in the general linear group. And Lustig then has extended that notion to total positivity in other types. Postnikov worked with these totally positive Brasmanians. Uh, cluster algebras use these uh, things integral systems, quadratic algebras, and so on and so forth. So the quadratic algebras part, I will explain some things today. Well, I'll at least mention one connection. Combinatorics, again, some connections, obviously. The rest of them, no. But the idea is, yes, they do occur in many, many different subfields of mathematics, and it's a sort of an underlying nice theme. So let, let's understand some of these objects, or some of these examples. So if you look at the lower triangular matrix, you know, so Every entry on or below the diagonal is one. Every entry above is zero. Then you can take any set of rows and any set of columns and check that the determinant is non-negative. Yeah, it's an explicit calculation. Uh, more, uh, more interestingly, shall we say, uh, generalized Van der Maan matrices are totally positive. So you take increasing positive bases, increasing real exponents, and then the matrix is totally positive. It's enough to show that the determinant is positive. Because, uh, because you can just take uh, any set of rows in any set of the, the same number of set of columns and what you get would be a sub matrix. It's enough to check the determinants are positive, but every sub matrix of a Van der Maan matrix is another Van der Maan matrix. So that's enough to check. Okay. Um, an observation of Polya, I think, is that the Gaussian kernel is totally positive. So this is an example of an infinite by infinite matrix. It's like real by real uh, matrix, right? So the idea is it's not really a matrix, it's a kernel. Uh, so if you take the kernel on a finite set, cross a finite set, you get a matrix. If you take it on more general sets like R cross R, you get this Gaussian kernel. And again, so I'm going to prove for you, in fact, in the next two lines that this kernel is totally positive. And so what does the kernel itself, it takes X and Y to E raised to X minus Y square times some kind of a inverse variance parameter. So suppose I take these rows and these columns corresponding to X, J and Y, K. The claim is that this matrix is totally positive. But again, by the same idea as previously, it's enough to show that the determinant is positive. But this matrix actually factorizes because we all know how to factorize A plus B square. So this is just E raised to minus sigma X, J square, E raised to minus sigma Y, K square, and then the middle term. And the key is that the minus and the minus cancel and give you a plus. So now, if you take determinants, the left and the right matrices are positive determinant, and the middle is actually a generalized Van der Maan matrix. And by the previous point, it's not hard to show, but anyway, 
this is also totally positive. So I want to explain some things, give some proofs, and really work out some basic examples today. So there are various kinds of objects that do yield totally positive matrices or kernels and so on. Uh, for today's talk, the notion I'm really interested in is neither matrices which are finite, not kernels which are continuous, but the discrete infinite analog, which is totally positive sequences. And they're actually called polyar frequency sequences. So, uh, so if you take a bi-infinite matrix and that gives you a polyar frequency sequence, if the following happens. If you take any set of rows and columns, then you look at, so, uh, Remember, I'm only looking at a, at a sequence, not a matrix. And I look at the matrix defined in the following way. So I just took at the matrix where A0 is on the diagonal, A minus one on the super diagonal, A1 on the sub diagonal and so on. So it's really a top lips matrix and therefore it's a bi-infinite matrix. And now take any set of rows and columns and you get that it's totally non-negative. In other words, the infinite matrix itself is totally non-negative. That's the definition of a polyar frequency sequence. It's very easy sequence of numbers, arrange them in the stop -lips matrix, take any minor and that has a, that is non-negative. Example, the Gaussians clearly give you a, a bi-infinite uh, such matrix because well, all you do is <clears throat> you, you basically, it's like saying you draw a sub matrix from this R cross R matrix evaluated the integers. So you get E raised to sigma NJ minus MK square or something, or as I write down, I guess, LJ minus MK square. And e raised to minus sigma is my parameter q. And then that's, this is exactly the definition of, the, this is exactly the result from the previous slide. Okay. So this is one example of polyar frequency sequences or PF sequences as I'll call them. Okay. And so for the, for today's talk, I want to focus on two kinds of examples. This is an example, which is never zero. The sequence is never zero. But sometimes you do get examples where there are only finitely many diagonals on the, in the matrix, which are non-zero. And sometimes you get examples when the matrix is lower triangular or upper triangular, this infinite matrix. So those are called finite polyar frequency sequences and one-sided polyar frequency sequences. Typically we don't say infinite. Okay. So I want to actually tell you how, so in today's talk, I want to tell you how to construct every single one of them. Okay. And then, the, of course, the hard part is to prove that there are no others. So that's the hard part, which I won't tell you. I'll just tell you that there are no others. Okay, so, um, so this is the point of two remarkable results from a while ago, which say that both finite sequences and one-sided sequences are simply obtained by multiplying basic ones, which I will call atoms of this talk. So I will explain the atoms on the next few slides, but for now, let me tell you my products. So, so suppose I have a one-sided sequence. Clearly, this is more general than the finite sequence because I can always take 0, 0, 0, 0, we also call it. Uh, for this sequence, I attach a generating function in the spirit of combinatorics or maybe even analysis. Uh, and so this is the generating function. Now, if I take two sequences like this, then I get two one-sided polyar frequency sequences and their corresponding top lips matrices. What we know is that you take any set of rows and columns of this matrix, you get non-negative determinant and the same here. So if I look at the product of these matrices and I take any set of rows here and any set of columns in the other matrix, then by the Cauchy-Binet formula, this is just the sum of all possible choices of columns here and the same rows here. Yeah? And you add up the corresponding products of minors. But since every single minor is non-negative, their products and the sums are non-negative. And therefore the product matrix is totally non-negative as well. That's just the Cauchy-Binet formula. But you can check by hand that this product is actually also a top lips matrix. And guess what? The diagonal is A naught B naught. The sub diagonal is A1 B naught plus A naught B1 and so on and so forth. So what you get are precisely the Taylor coefficients when you multiply the two power series upstairs. So this product matrix actually precisely corresponds to the coefficients of this power series. And that's what allows us to construct new examples from old ones. So this is what I say when I said that they are products of atoms, I mean, you look at two polyar frequency sequences, which are one-sided, look at the generating functions, multiply those and write that as a new power series. That is the generating function of a new polyar frequency sequence. So that's what I mean by products. So now let me tell you about the atoms. So what are the basic building blocks of these one-sided and finite polyar frequency sequences? So first the finite ones, which is simpler. So I claim that the following two are examples of finite 
for their frequency sequences. Basically, if you look at the first one, that corresponds to a matrix, which is a diagonal matrix with a positive number here. So, of course, every minor, every determinant, every sub matrix either has a row of zeros or a column of zeros, or it has a naught along the diagonal. It's a diagonal matrix, positive determinant. And similarly, I look at the other one, it's one comma alpha. So that looks like the following. And if you take a sub matrix again, so there's only, uh, let's see, there's only one here and alpha here and everything else is zero below and above, right? So if you take a sub matrix again, either you have a row of zeros or a column of zeros, or you have a triangular matrix where the ones are on the diagonal and alpha is below it. Or you have a triangular matrix where the alphas are on the diagonal and the ones are above it on the super diagonal. Either way, it's a triangular matrix, positive diagonals. So again, it's totally non-negative. And that's what I just wrote down here. Every square sub matrix either has a zero row or column or is triangular with positive matrix. So these two are clearly examples of uh, finite polyar frequency sequences. What are their generating functions? A naught and one plus alpha X. So now I can do the multiplication by the previous slide, do a bunch of these things, each of them generates a polyar frequency sequence. Let's say all the alpha j's are positive. Claim, this is it. There are no others. Okay, so this is a well-known result. And you even find it in like algebraic text. So there's a book or a, basically a book kind of survey by Jim Borger on the wit vectors and bit functors and Schur functors and all kinds of things I don't know anything about. And he mentions this result in there as well. But yes, it's, it, you see it in lots of different places. You see it, of course, in uh, Brenty's book or memoir on you know, such sequences occurring in combinatorics. And obviously in analysis, you see these things. So the following are equivalent. There's a finite polyar frequency sequence. If and only if generating function, this guy has M negative real roots. So I just told you that uh, one implies- so, Is the Whitney Hasler Whitney, you know? No, yeah, so yeah, the, this Whitney is Anne Whitney. She was a student of Schoenberg. And uh, Essen and Edray were students of Polya. So okay. this is some of this close knit circle. And yeah, so Schoenberg named, Schoenberg actually discovered a bunch of these things, which he named after Polya. And then yeah, these are Polya students as well. So uh, yeah, so I think I told you why two implies one is true. Yeah, that's the statement above. And clearly two implies three is true. Uh, one implies two is the hard part. But let me tell you why three implies two. So the generating function is M negative roots. Clearly that means it has real roots. The claim is, and this is how the way you find this written in uh, say combinatorics text, like Brandon has a survey, Brenty has a memoir. And they write that if the generating function is a, pol is a real rooted polynomial, then that is generating a polyar frequency sequence. But you see here we always require negative roots because one plus alpha one X should be zero. So it should be negative alpha one inverse and these alphas are positive. So how does one prove that if it has real roots like this, then it has negative real roots? Well, the answer is, so you know that the, the key is that you have to use the fact that the coefficients are all positive. Because the coefficients are positive, if you look at the number of positive roots of this, that is bounded above by the number of sign changes at the coefficient. That's an old result in the 1600s by Descartes, right? Descartes' rule of science. Since there are no sign changes, there are no positive roots. Since the constant term is and the leading term are all non-zero. There are the zero is not a root, and so all the roots are negative. So that's yeah. So these results are from the 1950s, but one of the implications is from the 1600s. In fact, actually, uh, if you have ever heard the name uh, of, if you have ever heard the phrase variation diminishing property, and the fact that these sequences and polyar frequency functions, totally non-negative matrices, all of these have that property. The word variation there comes exactly from Descartes' rule of science. It is the variations in the Taylor coefficients, in the signs of those coefficients. And so morally speaking, that, that result from the 1600s somehow underlies these. The connection is through work by Laguerre in the late 1880s, in the 1880s, not late. And that's how he connected that to something uh, that was actually studied as polyar frequency sequences. Anyway, so but that's somehow analysis history. Let's get back to uh, <clears throat> these sequences. So as I said, uh, a, a finite sequence of positive real numbers is a PF sequence padded by zeros on both sides, if and only if the generating function has real roots. Well, those kind of PF sequences, of course, show up in combinatorics. So I'll take one slide on this uh, to say that I am not an expert. I should always put in disclaimer. So yes, a real sequence is PFR, meaning polyar frequency of order R, 
if for you take this again this you take you know the y infinite topics matrix and you take one by one sub matrices or two by two or three by three until r by r but no further and all these uh, at most size r minors are non negative then that's a totally non negative sequence of order r or polya frequency of order r and so, for example, the PF1 sequence is just a simply a non negative sequence, which in his memoir, Brenty says are the only ones in combinatorics that are meaningful because you know, they're non negative. They try to count something, maybe even with integer values. A positive tuple is a PF2 sequence if and only if it's log concave. I think some, some places this is called these kind of things are the Turan inequalities, although they are more general, I think. So, and so in general, of course, you have PF1, PF2, you can have PF of order R. So this is just the thing that these are positive and the two by two minors are non negative. And if you take PF of order infinity, meaning PF, then every polya frequency sequence, which corresponds to a rooted polynomial, corresponds to, well, implies that that tuple, particular tuple is strongly log concave, which in particular implies is log concave, hence unimodal, and these kinds of things you will find in, you know, in, in combinatorics. So I've just put in one example, but of course there are several far, far more comprehensive and detailed you know, notes and books and surveys on the subject, which you should refer to if you have more interest. Okay, so now let me, so I told you what are the finite polya frequency sequences. Now let me tell you about the infinite one-sided ones. So clearly there are, the previous ones are one-sided because everything below the, with negative index is zero. But now, can there be ones that keep going all the way? The answer is yes. And that involves only one other, as I call it, atom and taking limits. So uh, recall the following. So I told you that this lower triangular matrix, so that was put there for a reason. This lower triangular matrix with ones on and below the diagonal uh, and zeros above it is totally non-negative. In particular, uh, you can, so since I can take a larger and larger collection of such matrices and embed one inside the other, I see that the infinite matrix with, or the polya frequency sequence with ones at stage zero, one, two, three, and zeros below it is indeed one sided. And what is the generating function of that? That is precisely the geometric series. So this gives me by direct verification of this, a one sided polya frequency sequence. And because I take any finite set of rows and set of columns, I can embed both of those inside a huge sub matrix of this, but finite sub matrix of this by infinite matrix that by the line here or the example is totally non negative. So this, this is a polya frequency sequence generating function. Now what I can do is if this is true, then I can claim the same holds for one plus um, C, C X plus C square X square plus so on. So one over one minus C X. Okay. And that is exactly by the same trick as the Gaussian. You pad by two diagonal matrices. Let me show you. So the claim is that this functions, I call it A1 for a reason. This is AC. So 1CC squared, this geometric progression is a PF sequence. Proof, take the submatrix indexed by these rows and these columns as always. Well, this is just C raised to LJ minus MK times the ones matrix. So again, C raised to LJ here, C raised to minus MK there, the ones matrix here, the determinant is again non-negative because positive, positive, non-negative. So again, so this is my extra atom. This exactly is the extra atom that I need. Therefore, now I change, C, I call C as beta because I had called those things alphas. So one minus beta X inverse is a PF sequence, which is what I just proved here. And also you can take limits. So if you take, what, what am I saying by taking limits? If I take any, where is, let me show the matrix. If I take any such by infinite matrix, if I take a sequence of such matrices and I fix some positions, then for every matrix, those positions give me a non negative determinant. Therefore, in the limit, those positions give me a non negative determinant. So a sequence of PF, uh, a sequence of PF sequences is a PF sequence, right? Sorry, converges to a PF sequence. So uh, I'm a little lost. So the, yes. the, is this point wise limit? Point-wise, uh, point yeah, so every stage. Yeah. That function is that uh, positive, totally positive kernel in the sense of polia. I mean, or, it is totally uh, not negative, non-negative. Okay. Everything is non-negative here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that is, uh, I mean, model non-negative. That is the that is a kernel function. That is a kernel from z cross z to r. Uh, 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 yes. 
Oh, okay. I'm just looking at sequences, remember. So they're indexed ah. by integers. Okay. So, oh, okay. I have a oh, integers. Huh. So the so the generating function is uh, I mean uh, it's strictly a generating functional function only. It's not. Uh, I'm not, it's not a, converging in any kind of formal sense. No. Okay. In okay. any kind of analytic sense. No. It's just a formal okay. power series because it's a limit of uh, these power series. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, so I'm just looking at it formally, but. If I, I will tell you that things converge in a minute, but yeah, so far I've just said take a limit of such sequences, one sided generating functions, they will give you a one sided generating function. Okay. Because you take a limit of matrices and for every position you fix, you get a limit of non negative determinants, which is non negative determinants. Uh, so I, I may not be the only one who's lost here. Can you recall the connection between the generating function and the matrix? Yeah, yeah here you go. So the generating function of, I'm just looking at one-sided sequences, finite yeah. one-sided. So that means the matrix would be, uh, first of all, toplets. Uh, right. And so the definition is I choose any set of rows, any set of columns, the sub-matrix is non-negative determinant. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you think of psi a as multiplying uh, a series on the left, or, I mean, or, or on the right, so, and then if you look at the action on uh, the coefficients, is that given by TA, is that? Uh, that is exactly right. So, in fact, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, if you, so if you, uh, for instance, so you see here, this is not a bi-infinite matrix. I've stopped it at this point, and I'm going one-sided infinite. Okay. And okay. that's exactly right. The, if you write down the monomial basis for x to the zero, x to the one, x to the two, then this is exactly the point. So, uh, and the notion of total positivity of T A, in terms of psi a, is there a somewhat uh, sort of understandable translation? Uh, that's the theorem I'm about to tell you. That oh, we okay. can, one can characterize exactly which of these functions are uh, totally generate these kind of sequences. But for now, the naive understanding is literally that it's just a generating function, but this toplets matrix should be totally non-negative. Meaning I take a okay. finite set of rows, a finite set of columns, take the submatrix. Oh, okay. So the characterization of the psi a is not obvious. It's not a... So oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I use okay. something like Nevalina theory and very, very deep analysis and so on. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm going to, I'm going to tell the obvious side of it, which is my goal is to tell you that these, all of these are, uh, all of these psi a are indeed uh, totally non-negative. The hard part is proving that the converse holds. Thank okay. you. So, uh, so as I said just now here, if you look at these two, then these just give you either a diagonal or a two diagonal matrix. Those are the atoms of the finite polyar frequency sequences. They correspond to linear psi A and the products are every possible. So these are all clearly finitely many diagonal, uh, finite polyar poly frequency sequences. The theorem is that there are no others. There are no others. This theorem itself is a special case of the more general one-sided theorem, which is what I'm getting to. So for the one-sided theorem, we will have this atom, of course, a constant term. We will have these atoms, 1 plus alpha ax. And as I said, we will have the atoms which are uh, 1 minus beta x inverse. Okay, so these. And now, so I'm going to construct now. So as I said, I want to tell you every possible uh, one-sided polyar frequency sequence. So I'm going to construct them using the two atoms earlier, a naught and the linear ones, these geometric series and taking limits. So, as I just said, since the AMR, if, if you have a sequence of PF sequences, which converts coefficient wise or point wise, uh, the, then the limit is also a PF sequence just by taking the determinants of limits. So, the limit should be analytic to, uh, I guess, to associate a, a meaningful uh, series yeah. to it? Yes, it will be analytic. It will be entire, in fact. Thank you. So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and the next slide will tell you exactly these limits. So in the first place, then let me look at one example of uh, taking limits. So uh, I told you that these finite, the finite ones are gone, excuse me, two in slide before. But look at this one, one plus delta over m times x, delta over m is positive. Uh, I take m copies of that. Well, this is still a polynomial with negative real roots or real roots. In fact, it's more than enough. Therefore, it generates a polyar frequency sequence for every m. And therefore, so does e raised to delta x by taking limits, right? So that means, in, in other words, the generating function or this, this is a polyar frequency sequence. Right? And I could even take e raised to delta x. So I could take delta raised to n over m factorial for the nth term. Okay, so that's another example. 
So now I've told you three different types of examples. One is products of real rooted polynomials above, negative real rooted polynomials above. One is e raised to delta x here. And one is this kind of a term, therefore products of this kind of terms. Remember that products of those toplitz matrices were giving me toplitz matrices. So the class of one-sided PF sequences or their generating functions is closed under taking products. So here are three examples, the exponential and this kind of a product. If I take limits, then I can take an infinite product as well, provided the alpha j's are summable and positive, non-negative. And similarly, I can take an infinite product of the denominators as well. And therefore, I can multiply all of these together, putting all of these ingredients together. This is a general class of polar frequency sequences, which are one-sided, provided the alpha j's and the beta j's are non-negative and summable. Theorem, there are no others. And as I said, so this uses yeah, various deep results uh, from by Hadamard, by Nevandina, and Picard, and so on, which, yeah, is, uh, which, yeah, which was the point of the proofs there. <laughs> but uh, so this also, the, the reason there are these two papers, and they have jointly another third paper in Proceedings of the National Academy, which pre announced those results, and then and they announced them in the ICM in 1952 or something. Yeah. And then proved all these results in the 50s. So yeah, all that happened in sort of a big concentrated period of time. Curious um, is, yeah. To what extent is this uh, expression unique? I would, this is kind of, I would assume it's unique, right? This unique. is the Hadamard factorization of entire functions. So okay. I would assume these are unique. Obviously up to permuting. Yeah. Okay, those are the poles and those are the zeros. And ah, the ah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. Everything from the kind of function. Yeah. So you can just look at the function and kind of try to see if it is. From this you form. could, in principle, absolutely. Okay, thank you. So this is the, this is the thing about uh, polyar frequency sequences. Let me again go back to uh, the work of Brandon, uh, since we talked about real rootedness and uh, these things. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, as the title kind of suggests. So what if this function, so what if, let's look at this generating function of polyar frequency sequence, what if it's entire? Sorry, so I, I sort of, I spoke, I misspoke, that wasn't, these aren't entire functions. The next slide will talk about the case when they are. So what if it is entire, that means there are no poles. So it is exactly of the form of the numerator, as I wrote here. Now, uh, this generates the theorem, and this is a theorem I mean, of course, modulo the previous theorem, so it's not strictly speaking from 1914, but an entire function generates a one-sided PF sequence if and only if it is of this form above. And in 1914, Polya and Schur proved that a function is of this form above if and only if, uh, if you look at the Taylor series of uh, the Taylor coefficients of the sequence multiplied by n factorial, you get a multiplier sequence of the first kind. What is a multiplier sequence? It is precisely a sequence which when entry-wise multiplied, like the Schur product that I like to work with, give preserves real rootedness. So if summation, if this is a real rooted polynomial, then so is j factorial aj from here, from this sequence, times cj times x to j. Okay. And this is if and only if. And this theorem actually, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful theorem with a really beautiful proof as well. Um, and this circle of ideas of understanding multiplier sequences in one dimension, in multiple dimensions, uh, has found a lot of yeah, very, very uh, deep generalizations in very recent work. So, so for 90 years, that kind of lay dormant and then Burche and Brandon picked this up and uh, they went ahead. In fact, so they, this talks about preserving roots in a trivial sector of the complex plane or a double sector, the real roots. You can talk about preserving roots in more, uh, in more general or in other sectors, in other regions of the complex plane, in circular regions and so on. And that's what Borchea and Brandon called the Polya Shur program about which kind of multiplier sequences preserve real rootedness, preserve sector rootedness, preserve circle rootedness, disk rootedness. And that is exactly the kind of work they have been doing. I mean, had been doing. Borchea has now passed away. And that circle of ideas and real stability and hyperbolic polynomials was, of course, famously taken forward by Marcus Spiel and Srivastava. And uh, that is well known, I think, to many people. Oh, so that is maybe the end of this part of the talk. Uh, no, not yet. Okay, so there is one more connection from polyar frequency sequences. Why were people interested in these polyar frequency functions and sequences? Uh, well, for example, 
there are other analogs for polya frequency functions, but here is the one for sequences. So this was somehow observed as late as 2000. Consider the Riemann psi function. Uh, if you define psi one to be this one, then and the Taylor series of these, the Taylor coefficients, generate a one-sided polya frequency sequence, then you have proved the Riemann hypothesis. And conversely, this is all equation only. Okay. Um, and that is because essentially the moment uh, this this thing that is because of this entire factorization, entire function, a thing generates polya frequency sequences if and only if this function is in the Laguerre polya class, in the first Laguerre polya class, and that Laguerre polya class. Uh, was linked to polya should multipliers in this very paper. So this kind of result was known to polya, but somehow it was written down much later. And she not only that, she proved that psi one is polya frequency of order at least 43. Meaning if you take submatrices of size 41 or 35 or 43, then the determinants are all non-negative. Of course, you have to prove it for order infinity, which is the hard part. Uh, what she did show is that it is asymptotically PF of all orders, there is some technical meaning of that. Okay, so that is sort of one, um, yeah, so that is some of the many connections that polya frequency sequences have. Uh, now going to sort of less, you know, exalted connections, if you will, I'll tell you about Hilbert series as they show up in algebra, like these sequences as they show up as Hilbert series in algebra. So recall that for any graded vector space, uh, Vf, Vn, over any field, the Hilbert series is defined to be the power series like this, the kind of generating function, if you will. If V is, let's say, Fm, standard m-dimensional space, then if you look at the exterior algebra, this is the Hilbert series. If you look at the symmetric algebra, this is the Hilbert series. And you might notice some parallels to what we just talked about. We said 1 plus alpha x generates a polya frequency sequence. 1 over 1 minus beta x generates a polya frequency sequence or one over one minus alpha x. And the products are exactly, if you put all the alphas to be one, you get this. If you put all the betas to be one, you get this. So guess what? These are both causal dual algebras, obviously, and they both generate polya frequency sequences from above. More generally, uh, this was the work, more recent work, let's say. This is, of course, classical. Suppose you have a R matrix, so it takes a, take a, let's say, a, let's take V to be F to the M again. So you have a finite matrix and it satisfies the young baxter equation. It satisfies the, Hacke relation, uh, yeah. Then you can define two graded algebras, the R exterior and the R symmetric. For example, if, if um, R is simply the flip map, and uh, yeah, if R is simply the flip map, and Q is equal to one, that's right, then you get the flip square minus one is zero, that's true. And then you, this would just become the usual exterior algebra and the usual symmetric algebra. Flip plus identity gives you wedge and flip minus, yeah. Okay, so that's a special, so the above is a special case of uh, this setting. In this setting- did you, did you mean to have a Q version of exterior on the, on the left? Uh, no, it should be apparently just R. So that's why there is no Q in the subscript here either. Ah. There's only a subscript Q here, yeah. So what they proved is that, uh, the, both of these authors proved that these two Hilbert series generate polya frequency sequences. And in fact, just like this case, if you put a minus x in one of the series, it is the reciprocal of the other. And that already also tells you that uh, if you look at the general form of the one-sided PF sequences, if you put a minus x, if you look at f of minus x and take the reciprocal, you will again get exactly this kind of a sequence, right? this kind of a form. So yeah, so either way, it's enough to prove that one of these is a PF sequence and that the other with the minus x is the reciprocal of the first. Anyway, they proved that. This was over characteristic zero with either Q equal to one or Q is not a root of unity. For other values of Q, even very, very recently, Scriabin is, has a preprint, it's still not published. So yeah, there is work on connecting totally positive sequences to these kind of things even now. And uh, Jim Borger told me uh, uh, that he's, he is fascinated by these sequences as they show up in algebra and he's looking for deeper connections as well. So yeah, and these show up in all kinds of places, but definitely in algebra. Okay, uh, return now back to the case where Q is one and- uh, I have a question, Napurva. Yes. Uh, so in this delta was, there was no condition on the sign of delta, it could be- Delta was non-negative, sorry. I don't know if I said that. Ah, I said it here. Here, you see, delta must be bigger equal zero for these functions to be 
then when you take the Positive. reciprocal, is it okay? What happens? When you take x to be minus x and take the reciprocal. Ah, okay. When you take x to be, I forgot yeah. that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, it, it works out perfect. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, if it's of sim and uh, exterior tensors, you take like uh, Schur functors, do you get anything nice? Uh, the... I think you should ask your collaborator. I don't know that myself. Your Spark Grant co PI, sorry. Jim, Jim should Jim, know. Jim, Jim. right okay. with his algorithm. So. I am sorry, I don't know. I, in fact, I found this out when I looked at his papers, when he sent oh, okay. a month ago. So, very curious, yeah, very curious. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he, I mean, this is obvious, this is trivial, but uh, yeah. Right, 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 no, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, he, will, he will be very happy to talk to you. I told him next time the pandemic is over, you come to India, let's all meet. Yeah, he was supposed to visit, but uh, yeah. yeah. He said he was in ICPS a few days ago and we met, and let's, this is being recorded, let's, let's get on with the talk. Uh, so let's get back to Q equals 1 and uh, R the fit map. So we are back to the symmetric and exterior, the usual ones. But now I attach a little more fancier grading. So let's say V is a countable dimensional vector space. And the gradings uh, of the basis Vj are alpha j, which are positive real numbers. Then the Hilbert series is exactly this. And let's say the alpha j's are summable, so all life is good. There's no problem. convergence issue. Then the Hilbert series is this. Fine. <clears throat> Guess what? What are the terms of the series? They are precisely the elementary symmetric polynomials. And therefore, you get the corresponding polya frequency sequence corresponds to this one sided or triangular top bits matrix. And this is totally non negative when you specialize each of the variables to these alpha j's. Again, all very simple things. And every minor here, therefore, when you specialize, oh, it's you. numerically positive. Let me just parse this. Thing. Yes. So the cursor. In what sense is this uh, positive, uh, totally positive? Totally non-negative. Is the same thing. This is just. Uh, I mean, I forget everything. I forget the fancy notation. Remember that if I multiply atoms, then you get a totally non-negative generating function. Right. If you take the limit of such things, you still get totally non-negative generating functions. Therefore, this is a power series which represents a totally non-negative matrix. But here you have a matrix of polynomials. No, so when you specialize the variable to equal alpha j, the last line. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks. So when you, for every specialized non negative. For every. Exactly. Provided they are summable, obviously. Yeah. Of course, that's what I was saying. Every minor is numerically positive when you specialize, but even more is true. And now we come to what Amri is talking about. <clears throat> but before I get to the what Amri is talking about, let me as well mentioned the other one, right? So similarly, if you take the same kind of Q equals one, the flip map, the countable basis with these graded degrees, and I look at the symmetric algebra, then I get this as the Hilbert series. And this generates a PF sequence if the alpha g's are summable. So once again, I do the same thing. I look at what the coefficients are, and you know what these are. Now the sum is over j less equals k, less equals l, and these are the complete homogeneous symmetric polynomials. Again, specialized to the roots alpha j. Or poles alpha j, I guess. Whatever. Yeah. Once again, every minor, because this when you specialize is totally non-negative, every minor is numerically, I say positive, but I mean non-negative. Blame it on the combinatorialists. So uh, and again, even more is true. And now we get to what is true. Well, all minors, not just uh, are numerically positive when you specialize, but if you take the determinants of anything here, you get monomially positive uh, quantities. Namely, that if, for example, if I take something like, let's say here, I take E1 times E1 is this square, assume these are variables now, this square minus this. And that is exactly summation alpha j square plus alpha j alpha k. Right? So you get a sum of monomials. There are no negative monomials at all. And therefore, if you have a sum of monomials and you specialize to real numbers which are non-negative, then you will get non-negative numbers. Uh, excuse me, I'm having trouble seeing uh, which way the... Uh argument is flowing and um, yeah for example with this page uh, so when you say this uh, this hilbert series generates a p of sequence uh, yeah. so where so is uh, where does that come from i'll tell you is why that, again right? is, so because is, is, as so i said this is not a special like matrix not a, with ones on the diagonal and below zeros above then that matrix is totally non negative you can check that directly by just calculating uh, Minors determinants, okay? 
Therefore, okay. a series, but that that matrix corresponds to one, 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 one. So that corresponds to the geometric series one over one minus x. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a specialization of. I mean, so in other words, you had this general uh, result of about uh, yeah, the form of the one sided. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so you are just specializing to just having uh, the reciprocals of linear forms. That's right. And, uh, and then you are easy. interpreting that as uh, Hilbert series. So that's, that's all there is so far. That's all. So you are not using anything about any argument about Hilbert series yet. And I mean, I never will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm just oh, saying. Oh, okay. So, so, so then why did you say this? I mean, I was just reminding people since we came from Hill, I wanted to first of all show that these series totally positive sequences show up in algebra in multiple. Ah, okay, 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 okay. And I'm okay. saying now let's return okay. back to the base case where there is no Q, there is no R, it's just a flip. And okay, you okay, want to okay. forget the R underlying algebra. I, well. And I can even forget the, the left hand side of this. H and the H left hand H side. Although my guess is there should be some connection, I mean, some algebraic connection that leads to the elementary symmetric, which Amri will tell us about. And okay. from the symmetric to the complete. I mean. So you're you're saying okay. You're saying that if I take the reciprocal of the linear forms and uh, write it out, uh, the corresponding topless matrix has these HIs. Yes. Like that. yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay. That said, if you look at these kind of terms, right? Where do these terms right. come? These terms come from counting the grading of the yeah, particular tensor Yeah. 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 And okay. since there is definitely a connection, but I mean, I will not do. It. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. And so the, what I really want to say is now I'm going to upgrade. So now I get algebraic. I'm going to upgrade from being numerically positive to something called monomial positive. So if you multiply h1 times h1 and subtract h2, uh, this times itself and subtract this, you will get back something which is still a sum of monomials, right? And things like that. And so the, that's the claim. That's the theorem. Every minor of this matrix with variables, not cons not non-negative numbers, and of this matrix with variables are still non-negative as sums of monomials and in particular of course when you specialize they are monomials. but of course this is still not strong enough you can do better and you can say that not only are they sums of monomials they are sums of these very special family of symmetric functions called sure polynomials each of which is a sum of monomials so they are sums of things that are sums of monomials so of course they are sums of monomials okay so that is exactly this thing in the slide in the title of the slide these are called the jacobi trudy and the dual jacobi trudy identities and so these are the kind of the first two examples for obvious reasons of numerical positivity upgrading to monomial positivity further upgrading to sure positivity and that's how you define sure polynomials well two of the definitions so that is yeah they they are morally the first example of such an upgradation okay. and so this brings us to sure polynomials and there are less rest of the talk is therefore in the last in the second section about sure polynomials so with apologies to Amri and everybody here, I will uh, define a Schur polynomial in a different way. I mean, in different notation. So for me, my tuples are decreasing of powers and the Schur polynomial is the ratio of this thing. I will define it in the other way presently, but I literally only care about um, N alphabets for N powers in this case. So I don't really, yeah. Okay, so example, uh, you define, so take say M less than N, I take u1 to the m, u1 to the n, u2 to the m, u2 to the n, take the determinant of the van der Mond, divide by 1, 1, u1, u2. And so I get this nice symmetric function. Again, as you see, it's a sum of monomials, no negative terms. And these are, of course, well known as the characters of polynomial representations and so on. Again, I will not use any of that. Let me put the disclaimer right now. Okay, so but they are also defined in this natural way using semi-standard tableau. So, um, for me, terms are again, uh, so I will, so example, let's say for those who haven't seen this before, I want to look at the Schur polynomial in U1, U2, and U3 uh, with the powers 0, 2, and 4. So the first thing is since I divide the van der Mond for these powers by the van der Mond, usual van der Mond, which is 0, 1, and 2, I'm going to subtract 0, 1, and 2 from this and get 0, 1, 2. For this tuple of uh, integers, I draw shapes with zero rows in the, zero cells in the bottom row, one cell in the next row, two cells in the top row. So two, one, and zero. And now I fill it with n equals three possible letters. And the rule is that my letters, my number should weakly decrease in the rows and strictly decrease along the columns. So here are eight possible, the eight possible ways, three, three, and then this must be a two, and so on and so forth. And you see that there's a three, two, one here, and a three, two, one here, and I will have these both counted. 
So now whenever I have a 3, 3 and 2, I write down u3 squared times u2 plus u3 squared times u1 plus dot, 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 dot. And so the corresponding Schur polynomial for three powers in three letters is exactly this. And these two terms in the middle contribute to a coefficient of 2. And this is precisely the character of the adjoint representation of SL3 because that's the zero, the multiplicity of the zero root space or the cartons of algebra. And then these are the other six non-zero root, spa the root spaces. Okay. This is one Schur polynomial. Here is another Schur polynomial for fun. Uh, three, two. So I have the shape is zero, two, and three. So I have zero, one, and one. When I subtract the staircase partition, I get zero cells, one cell, and one cell. Entry strictly decrease. So three, two, three, one, and two, one. Only three possibilities. So here you go. That's the Schur polynomial. Great. And now the claim is somehow. So clearly you see that each of these is a function, is a sum of monomials. So the value of this function, when I evaluate it again, increases along coordinates when you look at all the UIs being positive. It increases along coordinates. The claim is that the ratio has the same property. And the ratio, there is, as you see, this does not divide the numerator. There is no actual division going on. But nevertheless, the ratio has the same property when you evaluate it on the positive ortho. Okay, and that's what I'm calling the Schur monotonicity lemma. So that was actually observed by uh, us in joint work. So uh, for incomplete generality, so suppose you have any n, capital N, any tuple of powers here and here for the polynomials above and below, and my powers above dominate the powers below component wise. So nj less equals mj. Okay, then when you evaluate this on the positive orthant, this function is non decreasing in each coordinate. And not just that, there is some kind of sure positivity that we are going to show. Okay, so this is sort of the more recent example, if you will, of numerical positivity. As I, I'll explain on the next slide why it's numerical positivity, upgrading to monomial positivity, upgrading to sure. So this, so this is sort of a curious property of the sure polynomials that the ratios also have this increasing property when evaluated at real numbers. Okay, so let me show you the specific example. I'll actually prove this uh, for you in the special case that I drew those two pictures in. Why? So, uh, well, you know the quotient rule of differentiation, high d low minus low d high, or maybe up to a sign. So when you do that, it's, I want to prove this is coordinate wise not decreasing. It's a symmetric function. So it's enough to check that it's not decreasing in a single coordinate, let's say in uh, U3 it seems. So I do the I take the derivative and the denominator square doesn't matter. So I take the derivative uh, numerator part, and this is what you get. And as you see, this is monomial positive, and therefore numerically positive. And the claim, of course, now from the previous slide, the punchline is that not only is this monomial positive, it is clearly not a symmetric function because you differentiate with respect to u3, but therefore it is a symmetric function in u1 and u2. So what I do is I write this out expand it in powers of u3 and the claim is every coefficient of each power of u3 is a sure positive coefficient. So here are the coefficients. There's a u3, so there is no constant term. Everything is linear or above. So the constant term in u1, u2 is zero when you write it in this way. The linear term you can check is this, which is twice a sure polynomial. And the quadratic term is u1 plus u2 squared, which is also a sum of sure polynomials. It is not a sure polynomial. In any case, every single coefficient here is should positive in this specific example. And that's, so that's a more recent, as I said, phenomenon of uh, numerical positivity of the ratio function or of the, let's say, uh, the derivative in the quotient rule, upgrading to monomial positivity, further upgrading to sure positivity. This turns out to happen in general. So by symmetry in the quotient rule, it's enough to look at this and show it's numerically positive. This will follow if it's monomially positive. And it turns out that if you expand it in powers of un, then every coefficient is a sure positive polynomial in the remaining variables. Okay. And the key ingredient for this is a sure positivity result. It's a very big hammer by uh, Lam, Kosnikov, and Pilyavsky, uh, which in turn comes out of Skandera's results, which were working with totally non negative matrices. So somehow at the heart of it, again, you find totally non-negative matrices. Uh, but yeah, this is a big hammer there and that follows from this Candera's results and by Hyman and others. Okay, so finally, in the last few slides, yeah, I think I have time. 
So what did I say? I said that suppose you have M, a tuple of powers that dominates these powers N coordinate wise, then the ratio of the corresponding shear polynomials is coordinate wise increasing on the positive ortho. So in particular, if I look at the values at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, you know, the wild dimension formula, if you will, then this ratio beats this ratio, just because every it's increasing on the coordinates, as long as u is in 1 to infinity. So it's natural to ask, are there other powers, uh, m and n, for which this inequality holds? And it's natural, but also it was done, like a similar thing was done earlier. So that, that's actually how I got the motivation to look at it. We, we got so uh, what we proved is that, uh, yes, given these things, without the coordinate wise domination condition, the above inequality holds for all u above 1, if and only if m weakly majorizes m. Weak majorization means that you start summing from the top, take the partial sums from the highest power downwards, those for m beat those for n. So the biggest m term beats the biggest n term, the sum of the biggest 2 beats the sum of the biggest 2 and so on. Okay. That's weak majorization. So clearly a tuple of integers weakly majorizing another tuple has no connection a priori to Schur polynomials. Nevertheless, uh, here is a connection to Schur polynomials. So that's somehow interesting that there are consequences in completely different analysis areas of this kind of Schur positivity by Lam, Postnikov and Pilyavsky, if you will. Uh, so as I said, this problem was studied by others, including Skardera himself, on the entire positive orthant, meaning they classified or they half classified when this inequality for which powers does this inequality hold on the entire positive orthant. And this is the result. They prove that if you are given two tuples of integers, then this holds for every u in the orthant if no, only if m majorizes m. Okay, so this was uh, worked out uh, not too long ago, is this decade. And majorization just means that the total content is uh, equal to total content. Now, this might seem suspicious because this seems sort of a bit uh, you know, like one-sided, right? This inequality is symmetric. If things go above one, things go below one. But this doesn't seem symmetric. Well, the point is it is symmetric because uh, the another characterization of majorization is that M majorizes N if and only if M weakly majorizes N and negative N weakly majorizes negative N. Because basically the partial sums from the top beat this guy, but that means the partial sums from the bottom here would beat this guy. Uh, since the total content is the same, since the total content is the same in majorization. So that's how you sort of prove. And in fact, that was what led us to prove. So in the paper with Tao, we show that it's enough to prove this, not on the positive orthant. It's enough to check that if you know that you take something, say, uh, take, uh, take a countable sequence of tuples uh, of u's, uh, in one infinity to the n, where the powers are where the u's are going to infinity. If this inequality holds on that countable sequence of tuples, then m, v, m weakly majorizes m. And in particular, therefore, one can refine this conjecture to say that if this inequality holds for a countable sequence going to infinity and a countable sequence going to zero, then m majorizes m. So that we just did that in this paper with Tau, in slight extension. Uh, but that follows because of our, uh, the, the proof we gave. The previous result because then we get that m weakly majorizes n and negative n weakly majorizes negative n. So it m majorizes n. Uh, and then Cutler, Green, and Skandera actually conjectured that of course the converse should hold and you would be, you know, like re very reasonably in your rights to believe that it does hold given the previous slide about weak majorization being if and only if. And yes, the converse does hold, no surprises there. This was proved in 2016, much later again. And there's a different proof that came out, I think, last year of the same thing that the if part also goes. If m majorizes n, then this happens. Uh, this itself was proved using the Harish Chandra H6 and Zuber integral and so on. And even in our, our proof, in our paper, we use that integral, we use Gelfand's FN polytopes and so on. So a lot of the ingredients in our paper, although they deal with Schur polynomials as functions and so on, definitely involve these type A representation theory tools. Um, okay, so finally, uh, as I promised Amri, I will end with a question that would extend, that would answer something that I care about in this paper with Tao. So the reason we were working in this paper was to understand something about entry-wise operations preserving positive semi-definiteness in a fixed dimension, so something in matrix theory or matrix analysis and functions applied to them. And to, 
the so the reason I cared about these things being coordinate wise increasing is because I wanted to maximize this ratio over the positive cube, over the unit cube, of course, removing the origin where this uh, is uh, zero. So now that we know that it strictly increases in the ortho, we, we know that the maximum value is exactly at uh, one, 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 one. That's exactly it. And then, then it equals the ratio of the while dimensions, right? Once you understand where something is maximized and more precisely, what is the maximum value, this reveals tight bounds on certain classes of polynomial preservers. Uh, forget the rest of it. So it, understanding what the maximum value is on the cube is of interest to us for some reason. This is for matrices when you act on matrices with non-negative entries so that these U's are kind of like the entries of the rank one matrix U times U transpose. And all the U's are non-negative, so all the entries are non-negative. But of course, then I do want to know if the same thing happens when these polynomial preservers act on correlation matrices with negative entries. There are negative correlations in the world. And so one would like to understand the same kind of thing. What we do know, uh, thanks to this work with Tao and the previous work, is that there is a sharp constant. There is a maximum value that takes happens. We don't know what the maximum value is. And so the question is, can one optimize some, this kind of a ratio over minus one, one to the end? Now, how do you optimize this over minus one to the end? There is a problem in this. The denominator becomes, can become zero. There are cases when the Schur polynomial evaluated at negative arguments or some positive and some negative can vanish outside of the origin. Of course, in the positive ortho, this is the sum of monomials. It will never vanish. Well, unless, you know, like one of the coordinates is zero. So one of the, you, you have a variable common and you specialize it to be zero. But let's say not that. So, on all correlation matrices, we need to bound this ratio on all of this minus zero, but after ensuring that this doesn't vanish at zero. Guess what? There are such polynomials, they do exist, and we did classify all of them. Uh, the only such powers are zero, one through n minus two, and the last one is one thing h, which means it's just a row. The shape of the young tableau is just a row, it's a complete homogeneous symmetric polynomial with even, uh, with even number of cells. Okay? So this is my question. Suppose mj is bigger equals j by powers coordinate wise dominate the powers below. If j equals 0 and n minus 2 and mn minus 1 is bigger than this much. Is it possible to maximize this on uh, the unit, on, on this double unit cube? And by homogeneity, it's enough to do so just on the boundary of the cube because the degree above is bigger than the degree below by the first line. And in particular, of course, I would be very happy if the maximum is attained at one, 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 but I have no idea. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's a problem that is still open. And if that works out, then that would be wonderful. So, as I said, Tao and I, we obtained some kind of a non-sharp constant for the maximum value. So, if something beats that non-sharp constant, then life is good. But of course, to be able to sharpen the constant and to be able to find a maximum phenomenon, and maybe even would be wonderful. But maybe at its heart, although maybe this is sort of ambitious slash optimistic, just like the phenomenon that led us to understand the maximum value here was a sure positivity phenomenon, maybe something similar holds on the entire author. Maybe there is some another hidden, more general or just entirely different sure positivity phenomenon in algebraic combinatorics, I mean, and symmetric function theory that leads you to maximize something like this. Of course, if you take the quotient rule and so on, you check that the things are all sure positive, obviously because that's the, what happens on the ortho. But does that give you everything on all orthoms? I don't know. So do one, does one need a different kind of argument for maximizing it on the entire cube, not just on the positive side? Okay, so that's, that's it. And uh, so uh, I'll mention that a bunch of the proofs are given in this, uh, these lecture notes I have on my website, including not just these proofs, but the proofs where fully I am sure of their multiplier sequence argument and of Schoenberg and all these other amazing results uh, in, in analysis. Uh, then the historical ones I quoted, so Polya and Schur, uh, when they classified the multiplier sequences, which led Borchia and Brandon to do stuff. This is these three author paper where they, gen they talked about every function is of the following form, the one-sided Polya frequency sequence generating functions. And from the very next page after the article ended, he started the article of Etre, where he, they ended with the conjecture, he solved the conjecture. And so both of them together, finally, both these papers solve that whole problem of classifying uh, how these sequences look like, generating functions look like. 
Schoenberg uh, had some more work on this in uh, Janus in 55. So this is all around the same time. And then Cutler Gins Kandera conjectured, solved one half of their conjecture. SRA uh, at MIT solved the other half. And then yeah, this is the paper where we worked out the weak majorization, analog of the majorization. Mm, okay, yes, that's it. Thank you for your attention. And for Thanks, your Thanks, uh, Yeah, let's unmute our mic. Thank you very much. So, uh, are there any questions? Just feel free to unmute and ask your question. By the way, so this is the thing I was telling you about Amri, that uh, yeah, this maximizing thing. Can you say something on the second bullet point, what it means? This thing? Yeah, because that seems to be one of the motivations for... That is, yeah, that is the primary for, motivation. Yeah, yeah so, so, so is there some way of uh, explaining yeah. it to a layperson? I mean... Yeah, I can even do so without this. Without this. So uh, without writing something down, so uh, so the point is the following: we are interested in uh, not we. This has been going on for decades now. Uh, if you take a matrix and apply a, a function entry wise, and if the matrix started out being positive, semi-definite, like a correlation matrix or something, then when does the resulting matrix be is positive also be positive semi-definite? So somehow preserving positivity but not acting on Hermitian matrices by acting on the spectrum, but by acting on the entries. So normally, when you act on some kind of a diagonalizable matrix, you, know, you take it apart, you act on the eigenvalues, and you put it back together. But now we are just acting on the entries. And uh, the first result in this class, which was by Schur, remarkably again, was called the Schur product theorem. And what it implies is that if you act by any kind of monomial, if you square every entry, yeah. a positive semi definite matrix, then you get a positive semi definite or if you cube every entry, or if you, you know, so on. And now if you can add and take limits of such positive matrices, you get positive matrices. So in particular, every power series with positive coefficients preserve positivity. And that happens in every single dimension. And in all dimensions, you can prove the converse also. There are no other such functions. But if you restrict to a single fixed dimension, n by n matrix or a fixed n, then you have a far fewer set of matrices to preserve positivity on. So you would expect that many more functions would show up. Many more even polynomials or power series would preserve positivity. And in particular, since if you have all coefficients positive, I told you that it works in all dimensions, you would hope that there should be at least one power series with at least one negative coefficient, which would preserve positivity in dimension n by n matrices. And until I wrote this paper with some other co-authors in 2016, a single example was not known. So what we did was we found some examples for a restricted class of polynomials. And so the point is what you can prove is that in dimension n, like in dimension three, let's say if I'm looking at three by three matrices, even for three by three matrices, a single example of a polynomial with a negative coefficient that preserves positivity was not. So what we proved is that if you have a three by three matrix, uh, then the constant term must be positive. The, or the non-negative, the linear term must be non-negative, the quadratic must be non-negative, the cubic term can be negative. And uh, in understanding how negative, that is this tight bound or the threshold. Uh -huh. It's a leading term, so it can't be too negative because if it was, then the diagonal entry of a matrix would become negative. And if a matrix has diagonal entry negative, it cannot, that diagonal represents the variance term, it cannot be negative for the matrix to be a covariance matrix, for the matrix to be a positive semi definite matrix. So the leading term can't get too negative. How negative can it get? So in the baby case, we understood the answer. We proved that we found the answer when uh, the first three non-zero terms in the polynomial are the constant linear and quadratic terms. Then the point is, then you turn out to the, uh, optimize or maximize the ratio of your polynomials where the denominator n is the trivial, the staircase partition, which means it's not really a ratio of your polynomials. It's just a short polynomial divided by one. And that is obviously maximized at the top part of the set. But when you have, say, if I didn't have a constant, suppose I had the constant term zero, or suppose I had a linear term zero. So I look at a polynomial with, uh, say, one plus 
x square plus x cube plus t times x to the fourth. Can t be negative? So the first three terms are positive. Can t to the fourth, can t be negative, t x to the fourth? And yet this polynomial preserves positivity on three by three matrices. And for that, you have to maximize things like this, where the denominator uh -huh. is a constant. And that is why it turns out. So maximizing this will lead to some sharp, to understanding what the t in the leading term, how negative it can get. Uh, to for that polynomial to entry wise preserve positivity in the fixed dimension. Okay. And that's what we were doing. But at the end of it, when you take determinants and so on, you end up with squares of ratios of sure polynomials. So, but even if it's a square, yeah, I still want to understand that this is maximized. Okay. Thanks. Um, so there were a couple of slides where things went by a bit fast, but when you were talking about the complete symmetric polynomials, that is just the Jacobi 2D identity, right? I mean, the the the, the minors yeah. are the sure polynomials, therefore it's sure positive. That's all there is. Nothing. That's else. all there is. Okay. I mean, either these are skewed sure polynomials or just genuine sure polynomials. Yeah. And now you're looking at ratios of two alternates, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can look at alternates. Yeah, frankly, if you can do it for integer tuples, I'll be very happy because from there you can probably go to rational tuples somehow and then take limits and go to real tuples or something. Oh, no, no. For negative entries, you can't take fractional powers anyway. So you have to work with integer powers. So, I mean, in this maximization problem. So the point is, in this problem, when you have positive entries, one can also can take any M. irrational powers. Yeah. But there it is not hard because once you know it for integer powers is maximized, then you look at rational powers and you look at instead of the use, you look at if you take the common denominator of the fractions of the powers is one over k. Then you look at u raised to one over k themselves, call those as y, uj to the one over k, call it as yj. And you look at sure polynomials with just the numerators of the fractions in the yj's, not the uj's. That is exactly the sure problem with fractional powers in the uj's. But then for that, I know the maximum is still at the highest point, and therefore I'm done. From the integer powers to the rational powers, you can go by taking the kth roots, capital kth roots or something. And then once you know it for rational powers, it's maximized at the top, or it's coordinate wise non-decreasing, then you can say the same thing for real powers. So rather maybe what I should be telling you is here. Let me where is this thing? Here. Yeah. If you look at this, and if instead if you take the ratio of alternates. Yeah. Generalized van der Mond determinants and the MJs are fractional non integer powers, MJ real powers. Then what I'm saying is u to the m over n is u to the 1 over n to the m. Yeah. So I reduce to the case of integer powers by looking at nth roots by taking n to be the common denominator of all these powers. So if I know this is coordinate wise non decreasing, and since then the root functions are non decreasing, this thing still remains non decreasing for rational powers. And then by taking limits, this remains not taking real, power. real powers with ratios of antimony determinants. And therefore, I can know, therefore, that's how we solve the problem or we stated the answer for everything, for all real powers in our paper. So in the but negative case, it's qualitatively quite different. I mean, Because you're allowed real powers. Or what? No, you don't have fractional powers anyway. So Where? In negative case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. In negative case, you can so, work with integer powers, but maybe that's a good thing as far as you know using algebraic combinatorics more goes. I don't know, but uh, yeah. By the way, there is an extremely cute proof of the fact that. Uh, so I said right that for the uh, optimization fact, you need to make, ensure that this uh, these polynomials of even degree don't vanish, except at the origin. Oh. Even if the u's are allowed to be negative, this is still positive, not just non negative, strictly positive, except when u is 0, 0. The cute proof is as follows you take a sum of, uh, you take any exponential random variable, standard exponential. Uh -huh. uh, you take independent iid exponential variables with uh, parameter 1, with the word rate parameter 1. Right. right. And you take summation uj, xj. Uh -huh. xj are the variables. That's exponential. That's, that's whatever it is. In the rest of some generalized or Lang distribution or some strange thing. Anyway, there's a different that's a different story for another day. But you look at e raised to sorry, summation uj, uj's are these numbers, not yeah. zero, times xj. 
take the two rth moment of that that's a random variable it has moments the moments are integrable everything is integrable life is good take the two rth moments those turn out to be exactly these polynomials up to some factorial term and that is actually at in fact if you look at the generating function of this thing being 1 over 1 minus that thing the product you can actually probably derive it from there using taylor series therefore now since this is an, this linear combination is not trivially a zero random variable or a constant random variable the moments are strictly positive and therefore this is true. this is in the book by barbino uh, lectures in convexity or lectures in polito uh -huh. but yeah so uh, that's one way to prove that these polynomials never vanish except from the origin at the origin and they are always positive because they are the even order moments of a non trivial random variable <laughs> okay. Barbino found this in 2003. Yeah. Okay. So there, there are hopefully maybe things like that, you know, may help. I don't know. But I mean, I would like to maximize a shoot polynomial whose powers beat these powers on the unit Q, on the by unit Q. And uh, I would be very happy if somebody had the one to answer this. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Well, uh, if, if there are no more questions, uh, we let's thank Apurva again. Uh